Okay, good morning. Um, our, our topic today is the, um, is the challenge of uh, climate change and, and how it relates to our discussions on the, uh, the future of the, um, the market economy. Um, it, it's, it's a connection that's impossible not to make um, uh, given the existential nature of um, the, the, the climate uh, challenge. Uh, sometimes I draw a, an analog um, or an analogy between the, um, the, the existential challenge of uh, climate change which is to our physical environment and the very different existential challenge that um, our um, discussions on inclusive prosperity um, up, to, up to date in this course, uh, which are also in my, uh, in my view existential, but much more to the health of our economies and societies and policies. Um, and so in that way, there is a, 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 a direct um, analogy. There are, there are at least two sets of um, connections that are brought up um, with um, when we bring uh, uh, when we bring up the discussion of climate uh, change, um, one is a, a possible tension um, between what uh, at least one perspective on climate change uh, brings to the fore, which is that um, economic growth, including the emphasis that that we have put here on productive development, investments in technology, improvements in productivity, which are of course the uh, the, the, the main drivers of economic growth, that those are a key problem from the perspective of decarbonizing our economy. That, that in some sense, something that, that we have taken for granted in this course until this moment. And, and I'm, I'm surprised that actually to, to this point that none of you actually raised that possible tension. It usually comes up at some point in the course, uh, but it hasn't so far, whether in fact our emphasis on growth, albeit inclusive growth, uh, is in tension with uh, this, uh, uh, this question of, of decarbonizing um, uh, and, 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 and averting the crisis of, of climate change. So uh, we want to talk a bit about that. So um, we'll set up you know, some part of this discussion on that question. A second set of connections, uh, perhaps less of attention, uh, but more um, uh, more of a potentially uh, reinforcing set of relationships with the kinds of, of, of issues that we've talked in this course today is with respect to uh, the, um, the, the, the variety of uh, market supporting and other institutional arrangements um, that, um, uh, that underpin a market economy. I think one of the questions that dealing with climate change brings up is the issue of, of this diverse mechanisms of uh, market, market relating or alternative governance institutions um, that um, we have begun to experiment with in dealing with the market, uh, in, in dealing with the climate change. Um, and there are some obvious parallels with our discussion about this variety of, 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 of uh, uh, market uh, institutions or institutional uh, uh, arrangements with respect to supporting productive, inclusive growth and making those connections both teach us something about how we address climate change but also reinforce and enrich um, uh, our discussions about these diversity of institutional arrangements and the possible paths uh, for, for, for the future. Um, so we want to talk about those, uh, those parallels um, as, as well. So what I propose is that we actually break up our discussion today into three parts uh, that take off uh, from that. Um, the first two parts somewhat um, shorter uh, than the final part. Um, and, and, and the first part um, is focusing on this issue of the possible tension with growth. Um, at the riv visiting the uh, discussion of uh, some of the advocates of degrowth uh, as a way of dealing with climate change. So having a bit of a discussion on to what extent this is a, this is a real tension um, or it's a false tension. Uh, that's topic number one. Uh, the second topic um, that I want to bring up after a discussion on that is uh, the, um, the main tools that um, economics has brought uh, to think about uh, p uh, possible solutions to the, uh, to the climate challenge. 
and how these link up with our discussions on, on various types of alternative institutional arrangements. Um, so entering the topic of these uh, market-based versus other methods of dealing with climate change. Um, and taking off from that, uh, following one of the themes of that second part, a third um, and broader discussion um, on um, uh, the broader sort of regulatory and governance arrangements uh, with dealing with, with, with climate change and how they might connect uh, with um, the, um, the, the other discussions we've had here on different types of uh, industrial policy on different types of, 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 of governance on, on these experimentalist methods of um, uh, starting from existing experiments and, and building from them in a, in a direction that, that makes sense. Okay, so that's sort of um, the, the plan, what I hope that I'll just make a short introduction uh, in each one of these uh, three topics and then we'll open it up to discussion. Um, uh, so first, uh, the idea of the, 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 the growth or the degrowth de debate. I'm sure uh, most of you um, have seen this discussion. Uh, the antecedents of this de debate go back to the 1970s when uh, there was a literature and a, an active discussion uh, in the context of the argument for uh, the so-called limits to growth. Um, there the focus was much less on climate change but uh, much more on the uh, l uh, supposed limits uh, on, of the resources, um, whether it's um, arable land, whether it's water, uh, whether other natural resources, and of course um, uh, the ecosystem and the climate as well, that these naturally put a limit uh, on how much growth could be sustained um, and that um, economists and others were blithely ign ignoring these um, resource constraints, these limits um, on, 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 on growth. I think it's fair to say that by and large those concerns, um, uh, most of those concerns have, have proved to be um, uh, uh, wrong. Um, there was a famous um, bet that was made back in the 1970s or perhaps early 80s between an advocate of the limits to growth hypothesis and an economist um, about whether um, 25 or 30, I forgot what the time span was, whether at, at the end of a sufficiently long price of time, uh, long span of time, the real price of natural resources would end up being higher or lower. So the, the presumption was that in fact if there are these serious limits on growth that the real price of resources, um, bauxite, copper, nickel, uh, all of these uh, would actually have to be, um, petroleum would have to be higher. The alternative economist perspective was that ingenuity and innovation and technology and discovery and exploration um, uh, uh, would be the solution uh, to scarcity. In fact, uh, the, the real price of these natural resources and minerals would be lower um, and the economists won by a wide margin. Um, so the, uh, so for a while, of course, this, 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 um, uh, uh, argument was downplayed, but now it's come back uh, in a kind of a much more directly um, uh, um, climate-related uh, kind of a of a of a uh, of a way. Um, so the the argument, um, probably the, the best known proponent of the degrowth thesis, uh, is um, an anthropologist at LSE called Jason Hickel, um, and the argument uh, has a number of of, of steps. Uh, one is the view um, that, um, that addressing climate change fundamentally uh, will require uh, a, a radical shift in the way of life. Um, that will allow the shrinkage of GDP and other economic indicators. And therefore, that's the main way that we can reduce the claim that our societies make um, on natural resources. Um, there is a linked claim uh, that in fact uh, growth of incomes as typically measured as growth of GDP uh, is really not critical, is not really required to enhance, enhance or maintain quality of human life. Uh, that if our objective um, is to enhance the quality of, of human life, um, that uh, conventional economic measures based on GDP and the growth of GDP are actually very um, delinked 
from that, that it's possible to maintain high levels and high standards of, of existence and living uh, without GDP. Um, with respect to um, the technological challenges of um, addressing climate change, the claim in this uh, school of thought is that, in fact, we do have the technologies to address climate change. It's not that we are lacking the innovation or the technology, but that these uh, technologies are not currently sufficiently widespread or that they're not put to good use, that the claim of sort of our existing consumer societies on these technologies um, essentially uh, um, uh, take them on, on different paths. So a key um, analytical uh, claim in the, in the argument uh, for uh, degrowth in the service of um, averting climate change uh, is, is you know, that this, this decoupling, uh, that it is, uh, that it is, that I guess one side claim that GDP is not a good measure, um, that we should not be focusing on it along with all the other economic machinery that comes with it. Um, and, and, and second, that we couldn't have, um, and much more fundamentally, we cannot have simultaneously GDP growth and uh, serious action on the climate front. Or that as the greenhouse gas emissions are inevitably linked with the growth of GDP and if we want to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions that we do have to reduce um, the, um, the level of, of, of GDP. Um, so that would be the, the, the basically the degrowth argument. Um, the counterpoint, the counter argument uh, would um, have, um, would make several points. Um, one is that in fact, uh, we know that um, uh, GDP and GDP growth and greenhouse gas emissions can be delinked. Um, we have evidence for since um, for nearly a quarter century now in most of the leading countries of leading economies in the world, uh, the top 20, 30 economies, uh, GDP growth um, has continued, yet in fact the absolute level of emissions has dropped. Um, so this is in fact one of the key successes of, uh, of the last quarter century that, that in fact not only has the emissions intensity of GDP has fallen, uh, um, that the absolute level of emissions um, has fallen as well uh, despite increases in growth. Now of course uh, the other side would argue that 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 is not enough, that we need a significantly sharper drop in emissions. But the fact is that in most advan advanced countries, this de decoupling has already happened. Um, second, uh, I think the argument that would be um, uh, put on the pro-growth side would be that it is not true I mean, there is, it's clear that GDP doesn't measure a lot of things that we care about. Uh, so no economist would uh, disagree about that. You know, if you, if you take a couple of days off work and s spend it with your kids and your family and go out um, uh, sort of into, the, into uh, nature, GDP is going to fall, uh, but presumably uh, you will have a happier uh, couple of days. So that's the kind of thing that GDP obviously falls quite short of in terms of measuring the things that humans uh, uh, care about. Uh, but the argument would be that as faulty as uh, GDP might be, um, uh, it is not true. It, uh, for the most part, it measures the things that people care about. Um, and, um, and the proof of the pudding would be um, that it is in fact the case um, that increases in um, human satisfaction, increases um, in life satisfaction are actually uh, correlated not just across countries, but also within countries over time uh, with increases in GDP, even at sort of very high levels of GDP. So that's to say, if you look at the United States, you look at Germany, you look at Sweden, relatively rich countries where you think that they have already passed the point where increases in GDP or increases in household incomes uh, adds, uh, adds to um, uh, life satisfaction. Um, and you ask in those countries um, as uh, whether as incomes of households increase, 
whether they're self-expressed life satisfaction, so you know, the broadest measure of, on a scale of one to 10, um, how satisfied would you say your life is? Um, the fact is that, that such measures of human well-being and life satisfaction are indeed correlated uh, with measures of income, the kinds of things that GDP, and that might be a bit of a surprise, uh, but it turns out to be true uh, that uh, people, now it's probably maybe not true at the very, very top level of incomes, uh, but it is certainly true um, for the, apparent for the vast majority um, of, of, uh, of people. Um, I, and I think uh, third, there is the question of um, the, the developing countries. Um, the developing countries in, in the years ahead, um, I mean, it's quite clear that developing countries have not been the major contributors uh, to the stock of carbon uh, in, the, uh, in the atmosphere um, that has come from the advanced countries. But in the years ahead, um, it's going to be essentially largely middle-income countries uh, the Indias and the Pakistans and the Brazils and the Mexicos um, who, that are going to be contributing to, to emissions um, in, uh, in, in, in the environment. Um, and in those countries, there's much less evidence of decoupling or decoupling uh, um, looks um, uh, much less um, evident. Um, so the question is how would the degrowth thesis um, address the needs of developing countries where it's much easier, much more direct to make the case that they do need to grow in order to find solutions to poverty and to uh, address um, um, uh, problems that their economies and societies uh, face. Now, there is a kind of a counter argument from the uh, degrowth side which says that, well, yes, of course, developing countries and especially low-income developing countries should be allowed to grow to a certain level of income. Um, uh, even as the advanced countries reduce their levels of GDP, but, but the practicalities of that uh, seem um, uh, not, 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 very, not very clear. Um, there's one final issue with respect to um, developing countries that, that I think in line of our previous discussions that's worth um, pointing out, is that the usual, um, the clearest source of tension uh, with respect to the growth of developing countries and emissions is the view that if developing countries were to emulate the path of previous industrial countries in investing in manufacturing and heavy industries, dirty industries, that this would create um, huge amounts of emissions, but yet that this is the only path to growth. Uh, but remember our earliest dis earlier discussions about uh, manufacturing um, and heavy industries not serving um, uh, the, the kind of escalator role, the potent role for economic growth that it does, um, uh, it used to, um, and if prem premature deindustrialization is a fact of the world, it is a kind of a silver lining. There is a silver lining to this uh, because it suggests uh, that, that, uh, that uh, today's and tomorrow's developing countries may not need to rely on that kind of carbon intensive, dirty industries intensive industrialization path in order to develop, in order to grow. Um, in fact, that that may not be a feasible path in any case, um, and that the alternatives that are going to be based much more on service industries uh, for smaller scale firms that are in general um, less carbon intensive, uh, that that actually is also um, potentially something that, that eases uh, this, uh, th this, th this tension. Okay, so, um, let me just uh, stop here on this uh, question of um, the possible tensions with growth and productivity and, and, and climate change um, and just open it up for, uh, for discussion, for thoughts, reactions, questions.
Well, I suppose, I mean, they would say that let's agree on the principle and then we can <laughs> discuss the details later. But was, you have to sort of make that mental leap into that, you know, sort of to, to, un, to, to accept the degrowth thesis. And then, you know, the discussion of whether we're talking about, you know, 50% less or, you know, 30% less, I think they would say that that's more of a process. Um, as we, we rearrange the way that we live, um, that becomes, um, a, you know, a something that we discover um, in the process of changing our, our way of life. Ximbi? Well, you can see, so there's a vi visual, you know, uh, first in terms of, I mean, I think you have, you're asking two questions. One is how much decoupling there is, and secondly, is it enough really to get us to, you know, you know, the two degrees centigrade, you know, Celsius, um, uh, um, uh, you, know, you know, keeping the global warming at no more than two degrees. So you can see what's, what's happening. And in some cases, it's pretty striking. I mean, the, you know, you can see, you know, Germany, um, the Netherlands, um, the, even the U U.S. So you can see the numbers there. I mean, Netherlands. So I guess the, the problem there is, is taking the, 2000, the year 2000 as the base. Um, um, so the, the, the actual sort of, you know, the actual decoupling is pretty impressive. But I think it's fair to say that you know, this is, you know, it's quite clear from the evidence that on the, on the current path that we need much more significant uh, reductions in emissions. And, and so it's, it's, it's definitely, it's a question that we want to come back in, in, in sort of in, in, the, in, the, in the subsequent parts of our discussion today as to what needs to be done because it's not on the path. No, no, I, I don't disagree at all. In fact, that was reflected in my, in my, in my surprise that nobody had brought it up yet. Um, uh, um, so I, I don't think we, I don't think we view climate change as, as marginal. So if I, if I, my introductory comments made it seem like um, that, it, but it, it has been marginal to our discussions in this course so far. Um, because that has not been our, our, our focus. Um, I think the, the point of this session is not to make the course about climate change. It's about to, um, first, in the context of this present discussion, make us question to the, ex the extent to which there might be a conflict between our focus on productive development and growth and the challenge of 
climate change, which we take as given. And second, to, um, to the extent that there is not, is to um, amplify some of the points um, uh, that we've made before in terms of how some of the governance arrangements we've been considering also carry over uh, to issues about dealing with, with climate change. So that, that's kind of the, this, this, the synergetic part um, of the discussion. Um, but our, our, you know, certainly this course is not focused on resources or climate. But let me say one thing which I think is important um, uh, which is the relationship between you know, the kinds of, of, of um, increase in incomes and growth and productivity that we focus on and the precarities with respect to resources and climate. Because in many areas, in fact, um, uh, there is a positive dynamic. Uh, that is that it makes it a lot easier for poorer or lower middle class households to actually avoid environmental problems uh, when they get richer. Um, and um, that's probably is, is sort of um, easiest uh, to see in the context of um, um, uh, air pollution, which is actually something that, so this is a very local source of uh, problems. And we know it's a very, I mean, you know, you know air pollution kills people. Um, so it's another version of, you know, sort of, you know, you know, landslides or something that take, you know, the house from under my feet. Um, but it, it's, 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 you know, there's a, a, a kind of a so-called Kuznets curve with a lot of these environmental issues, uh, which is that these problems tend to rise first with income and then tend to fall. Um, and that's because in the case of air pollution, there is a clear measure, uh, which is sort of, you know, the amount of particul particulates in, 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 in air. Uh, and also because we have measures of this that go back to all the way to, to the Industrial uh, Revolution, you can see how this Kuznets curve has operated. So this is measures of air pollution in London that goes back to 1700. You can see how it sort of has increased um, throughout uh, until about for two centuries. And then after 900 is a very precipitous decline. Um, so that yeah, you can see that all in other measures of local environmental quality, such as water quality and so forth, um, that that the uh, you know first you know the discharges environment you know industrial pollutants um, uh, 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 are you go into waters and rivers and lakes, and then eventually as incomes get higher, people get richer. You can af afford mechanisms to clean up uh, these local natural resources or to have protections against uh, sli you know, slide or build uh, more uh, durable housing and, and so forth. So there is a kind of, you know, outside of climate change and greenhouse ga gas emissions, in a lot of environmental issues, uh, there is a very positive dynamic uh, between uh, productivity and, and uh, uh, growth and, and, and these, um, these the quality of the environment. The other thing, my, while I'm at here, I want to put in is, is this, um, um, this thing that I mentioned in passing, the relationship between incomes and life satisfaction. And what's striking here is sort of is the gradient, um, is, is how there's a kind of lin you know, linear, almost linear relationships in percent changes between measures of income, measures of life satisfaction and measures of, of incomes, even at very high levels of income, if you go to the US and, um, and Germany and, and, and so forth. Okay, other comments, Maria? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good point that some of this, um, well, that's not the picture anymore, but the, the, the linkage, uh, the, the, the picture that showed the, the, um, uh, the delinking of emissions with GDP growth in part has been enabled by the transition of dirty industries from the advanced countries to low and middle income countries and then the, the, you know, the steel and the aluminum and uh, uh, other sort of uh, outputs being um, imported. 
uh, from uh, those uh, developing countries. Now, you know, the, the, the evidence on, well, so, 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 that, that, so the, the question is, is um, you, know, you know, there too is a kind of a complicated picture because if you believe that trade is a mechanism whereby low-income countries can increase their income, their, 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 their levels of well-being, it might well be that you know, a, a, a sort of you know, a, an important mechanism for increasing the demand for cleaner, cleaner air and, and uh, you know, aba abatement of emissions will be making those countries richer and that to that extent you know, trade is not necessarily making things worse or maybe it might be making better. Uh, but it is, um, it is one of these uh, you know, issues that, that have complicated uh, questions of, of trade, uh, particularly when um, as you well know, of course, Maria, when, when you know, sort of some parts of the you know, world, such as Europe, has um, uh, you know, sort of you know, carbon control mechanisms, and the question is the extent to which that can be um, uh, uh, undermined through, through trade, and what does it mean, then do you put trade barriers uh, on, on, on exporters of, of, of these industries, um, and is that not discriminatory, and so forth. Aaron? Um, I have a question that actually builds off Maria's point about, about trade, and I'm wondering how some of the, the both normative and practical considerations of two specific dynamics in terms of the relations between countries. One is with respect to what are called critical minerals. Critical? Other, critical minerals. Minerals. And the other is with respect to the EU's carbon adjusted border tax. Um, so I think we, from the IEA to like popular press, there's a lot of conversation about these certain minerals being critical without discussing the question of for whom. So in a, in a low income country, you don't have the luxury of wrapping a sports car around the battery. And at the same time, increasing demand for um, cobalt, lithium, rare earth elements has huge implications for export oriented growth, democratic self-determination, you know, possibility to recapture in countries like Chile, the DRC, and so on. I think it's a great shame, you know, Biden on the campaign was was the, the Amtrak guy and now he's become the, the electric Hummer guy. Do we really need electric Hummer? And that's a material question for developing countries that are resource rich. And the second piece is whether the EU, um, you know, putting in place a carbon adjusted border tax, in essence is placing an inherent limit on growth to countries that are trying to develop, trying to export steel, trying to export cement, uh, even electricity. So how do we deal with some of these, these both normative and practical considerations in terms of domestic and multilateral governance, especially when international finance and technology transfer is just, it continues to be absent? So the, the, the carbon uh, border adjustment mechanism that Aaron is mentioning, um, in case for those of you who don't know, is precisely uh, the idea that uh, the EU is going to impose essentially border taxes on tariffs. Um, on, um, on let's say, steel um, uh, from countries that do not have um, carbon uh, control uh, or emissions control uh, uh, mechanisms uh, to ensure that the uh, carbon control policies within the EU is not undermined uh, by, um, uh, by imports from countries where uh, environmental or climate regulations are, are much laxer. And that's the trade-off that is raised, whether, in fact, that is um, inimical. Now, um, so I, I mentioned in passing that there is a sense in which our discussions here have given a reason to believe that the tension is not as strong as you might have thought had these same policies been discussed 40 years ago. Uh, because I don't think you know, take some of these industries, you know, steel is pretty much an industry of the past. Nobody's investing in steel anymore. Um, you know, aluminum is basically just electricity. It doesn't, you know, is, is, has no, uh, you know, doesn't ge generate any employment. Cobalt, these are not um, fundamentally employment absorbing industries that are going to be driving the kind of growth that we want in these developing countries. So one, one way to essentially evade that question is to say that, Look, there is a tension, but the tension is not as, um, a, a, as deep as, and, and unsolvable as you would have thought uh, because the kind of way forward for uh, low and middle income countries is not uh, to basically develop these either 
you know, minerals industries or industries that are very intensive in natural resources and in electricity. Um, because that's not, you know, what's going to be generating, you know, sort of the absorption of employment and sufficiently productive. These are enclave industries that don't really generate and, and drive inclusive growth. So that's, that's one way of answering it. That doesn't, com as, I, as I said, that doesn't completely eliminate the trade-off because, you know, if you are, uh, you know, if you're Mozambique and your, you know, main uh, export is aluminum, you know, that's still foreign currency and you want to be able to sell it to the EU. Um, and, and so I think, you know, you have to think about mechanism of transferring um, some of the, um, for example, the, the, um, the, the, t the tax revenue that's generated by these um, import uh, carbon border adjustments, those can be shared with the exporting countries. That would make it, in fact, that was uh, Maria's um, second year paper in the Kennedy School about is just basically how to share the revenues from the carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, with the exporting countries. So that, but that's the general approach there, which is that, you know, if the richer countries are those that are primarily responsible, um, you know, they bear an, you know, a, a double burden to ensure that they share the cost. One, because they are the primary contributors to the problem historically. Second, because they're richer, they can, they can uh, pay the cost more. And therefore, uh, uh, financial and technological assistance with developing countries is essentially redistributing the cost has got to be um, a, a, a key element of, of a, any kind of a reasonable bargain. So let me let me go on now uh, to the to the second part because you know that also will be in some sense some of the of the discussion um, on sort of what are some of the, the the basic economics and the economics of of dealing uh, with with um, uh, 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 with with climate change um, and and that's going to take us to this uh, more interesting discussion on 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 on, on governance um, and institutional alternatives. So uh, the way that, that an ec economist thinks about um, the problem of climate change is really in terms of a, a fundamental a negative externality. Uh, that industries that emit greenhouse gases uh, make a contribution uh, to climate change. Uh, but uh, as long as those emissions um, of carbon and other greenhouse gases are not priced, uh, then essentially they do not pay the cost of uh, their environmental um, uh, 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 burden. So th the, the typical way in which, therefore, you address uh, a, a, an externality um, in economics is by imposing um, a, a tax, uh, if, the if the externality is a negative one, to essentially um, internalize the cost that the producer or the emitter uh, imposes on, on the rest of society. Um, so this is the, the, you know, the polluter pays principle, right? That, that uh, it would be a kind of, a pig, you know, the, the, the economics answer would be uh, a Pigovian tax um, uh, that is calibrated to the amount of greenhouse uh, gas emissions. Um, and so that would essentially involve um, uh, sort of uh, computing what the social price of carbon would be. Um, that is, what is the environmental cost, the climate change cost, of emissions and imposing that uh, a price uh, through a tax on emitters. Um, doing this in a price through the price mechanism, so this is the most market friendly way, right? That is, you, do, you don't do anything except by imposing a well calibrated tax on the emitters, uh, um, is the most fr market friendly way, has the advantage uh, that it allocates the cost of, um, uh, of, of reducing emissions uh, in a way that uh, ensures that uh, those industries and firms that pay the lowest cost um, are actually are, um, can adjust more uh, because the, ca the cost, those uh, industries that are the, 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 the highest emitters necessarily will, fa will pay a higher price uh, don't do, than those that are um, a, a lower emitters. Now, so this is the kind of, of, of the standard Pigovian uh, tax um, argument for uh, a carbon tax. Um, 
carbon tax has been remarkably unpopular, right? And we may want to discuss this a little bit uh, later on as to why that is so. Uh, but put that on one side now as the, as the, as the economist's traditional answer um, to climate change, or dealing with climate change. Um, there is an equivalent approach, uh, which is um, the um, cap and trade approach. Um, and under full information, in a world where uncertainty uh, does not figure prominently, the cap and trade approach is actually completely equivalent uh, to the carbon price or the carbon tax approach. Uh, because you can achieve exactly the same outcome by physically uh, putting a cap on uh, the total emissions, um, implementing this through essentially a permit system where each producer is given a quota or a permit of how much uh, they can emit. Um, and then allowing different producers to actually have a trading system where they can trade these permits across each other. So a kind of a tradable permit cap and trade system essentially replicates um, a, a, um, the uh, purely market-oriented carbon tax approach. Um, in many ways, it has the additional benefit that you have now a second instrument besides the cap, which is the permits that you allocate to different, um, uh, different uh, um, uh, um, emitters. And the allocation of these permits gives you an instrument as to you decide who bears more of the cost. Um, so if you give the original emitters big permits, then you make it less costly for them to reduce or uh, to the extent that they're efficient, of course, then they would be able to trade these permits with less efficient producers and reap the benefits uh, by being able to sell these permits. Um, in, the, in, in, a, in a global context, going back to the issues that are unraised about sort of who's paying the cost, you can imagine a global cap and trade system where developing countries or low-income countries are given very large quotas, very large permits. This would be a way to ensure, um, and that with those quotas, those countries that actually don't need them, that you know, basically you know, some countries in Africa get most of their you know, electricity from hydroelectricity, so they don't need to emit a lot, uh, they can sell these permits to advanced countries, um, and therefore it becomes um, a, a mechanism where um, they get some, some income transfers. So in other words, the cap and trade system allows you to divorce the question of efficiency, you know, sort of reducing emissions in the least costly manner uh, from the questions of equity and the allocation of these permits and the emission permits uh, allows you to, um, uh, to achieve any distribution or any equity outcome, at least across producers, uh, that you wanted um, at the outset. Now this is a system that is already in operation in California um, in, in, and also in the EU. Um, Although, of course, as you can imagine, a lot of politics goes into the, into the negotiation of who actually gets permits. Um, and the allocation of these permits has not always been very equitable. Um, now, the final point I want to make uh, he, um, here about with regard to the sort of the basic economics of how you deal with, with climate change is the important point that Climate change is a global externality. It's not a local externality. That is that you know, the emissions in Germany or in California uh, build up the local um, uh, you know, sort of stock of carbon in for the entire world. So it doesn't <coughs> matter where the emissions are coming from. Okay? So the logic of that is that from the standpoint of any individual nation or in any individual locality, um, they have absolutely no benefit to reducing emissions locally or nationally because climate change is the result of the stock of global emissions. Uh, so it creates this problem of a free rider. Um, and in light of the free rider, then it becomes a, because of a paradox as to why California, for example, a state within a nation has a cap and trade system, whereas sort of the California's own contribution to the global stock of carbon is relatively small. And even if they have a very successful program, that is not going to do much for 
um, uh, um, a climate change unless other countries um, to collectively do that. So that has been the kind of a problem that has, um, um, that has uh, created significant complications um, in being able to devise a scheme because it requires global cooperation and global coordination. And it's also you know, raised this puzzle from a purely economic perspective because you, know, you have this, apparently this groundswell of support for carbon controls in localities like California or within the EU, whereas sort of economically it makes no sense for these, uh, you know, these individual states or groupings of states to go it alone. Um, um, so, but I guess it's a good thing um, that, 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 they, that they're doing. So um, with that, um, unless there are any specific questions or, or discussions on, on what I've said on, on this part, on sort of cap and trade, carbon pricing, and the free riding problem, yes? Well, I would say, um, you know, I would make three points, you know, uh, you know two of them uh, about um, what these countries ought to do on their own, and a third about the global. Maybe let's do the, the third about the point about global is, is just what I said before, that any sensible mechanism for addressing climate change globally has to have real, uh, both financial and technological transfer mechanisms. Uh, to enable developing countries uh, to uh, ad adopt uh, uh, and use the requisite technologies um, and to have the resources to do so. So that has to be, I mean, that's quite clear cut. And I, so there's no, um, uh, you know, it, it's just that politically it's been difficult for advanced countries to make the, the requisite uh, um, commitments. But that seems very clear cut to me. Um, but there is, I think, also the things that developing countries themselves can think about and not simply view this in the context of we won't do anything unless we get the help from the advanced countries that we want. Uh, the first is, again, something I said earlier, for them to look at the industries that are the emitting industries and the carbon intensive industries and ask the question, is this our future anyhow? How much are they helping us? Uh, and the answer in many of these industries, for reasons I've said before, is going to be, well, yeah, I mean, you know, the sooner we get away from these industries, the sooner we think about our alternative development paths, you know, the, the, the better off we're going to be doing. That's with respect to just the structure of what you're producing and whether, in fact, relying on uh, carbon-intensive industries, dirty industrialization is really going to help you in the future. And, and uh, you know, for reasons we've already discussed, that's really, you know, it's, it's, it, it no longer is a kind of feasible path for inclusive <coughs> development. The second aspect of it is to say, look, you know, do we want to be part of the next wave of technological discovery and innovation or not? Uh, because you know, that's where the world is going. So the market for new products, new processes, new, you know, it's all going to be renewables. It's all going to be alternative forms of energy. All the technologies will be based on that. And the so sooner we make the transition to that technological trajectory in terms of our innovation and our, in terms of our thinking about our, our, our own R&D and our local development, you know, the, the sooner we invest in, in solar and wind and, and uh, geothermal and other things, um, you know, the better, you know the, you know, the quicker we're going to be catching up to where the world is going to technologically as well. So those, I think, would be arguments as to, you know, sort of, you know, uh, uh, that, that I, would, I would put. 
Yeah. Um, I guess given the political unpopularity of Carson Texas, has there been any serious consideration of, I guess, the inverse, which might be a carbon abatement subsidy? So paying firms to reduce their carbon emission off some baseline? Well, you know, that, that comes very close to sort of, um, you know, the, the, you know, so there are, there are, um, so there, there are two ways, there are two complementary ways to deal um, with the needed green transition. Um, so, so far I've talked about the, 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 um, the, you know, sort of, you know, raising the price of carbon, making it more costly to emit carbon. What you're bringing is, you know, how about actually subsidizing producers uh, to become clean, right? Um, and, and so I think a key point that I would like us to take from this is that sort of the way that economists actually think about this problem at present is that you need both planks. So you need both to have producers face the true social cost of carbon, whether it's through carbon taxation or through some cap and trade mechanism, through some standards and permit system. Um, and the other is to actually um, speed up the transition to a green economy by putting us on a technological trajectory uh, that uh, makes a lot more, that, that induces a lot more innovation and R&D uh, uh, in, in green and renewable um, uh, energy sources. So the key is that, that, that you can't, neither one of its own is going to be enough because if you simply rely on a high price of carbon, you're making it too costly for people and you're running into all these political difficulties. Um, so therefore you need to complement it with incentives to invest in renewables. Now the problem still is that, you know, you know old industries uh, will be with old technologies, won't necessarily be in the technological, um, um, in the technological uh, vanguard that will be investing in the new industries, but maybe they will be. I mean, you know, uh, the amount of investment in renewables that established oil companies do today is, is, is huge because they see the future coming. Um, so, but you need both planks. And let me just show you before we move on to the, to the final discussion, and I'll turn to um, uh, uh, Roberto here. One other picture which is um, quite striking and actually goes to this discussion of incentivizing technological change. Um, and this is um, the price of um, different sources of uh, energy. Um, so this is the um, you know what has happened to the to the prices um, over time as install capacity has grown. Um, just look at the, um, the price per megawatt hour of electricity of um, um, uh, solar energy, solar photovoltaic cells, right? The collapse of price in solar energy is just astounding uh, from $378 to about $68 in 2019. In wind, um, there's been, especially in onshore wind, uh, there's been in, you know, basically a, a kind of a similar reduction. Offshore wind is more costly still, okay? So th this is the big wins that we've actually had recently, um, which is that the prices of at least two forms of renewable energy, of uh, solar and wind, um, have come down significantly more rapidly than anyone had any right to expect. Why? Well, uh, you know, investments in new technologies, Okay, the kinds of you know, new technologies that, that we want uh, broadly to incentivize. Um, but what's more specific is that, particularly with regards to solar energy, has been you know, sort of China's programs of, uh, of you know, hugely subsidizing um, the production of uh, um, uh, PV cells, okay, solar cells. Uh, so in many ways, the reduction in the price of renewable uh, energies is the product of Chinese industrial policies, okay? Um, and this has been sort of, you know, um, subsidies through state enterprises, subsidies through national and local um, uh, um, uh, um, um, uh, governments, uh, credit subsidies. 
to the point that where many advanced countries either contemplated or were actually putting on you know, anti-dumping duties on importation of solar cells from, from China because the price collapse was clearly the result of government support. Okay, this is another area where the environmental arguments and the trade arguments clash, right? What China did was absolutely beneficial for the world as a whole, uh, but it created this commercial tensions with countries like US, Canada, and, and many countries in Europe as well. So I think this is, you know, maybe I will stop here as a kind of a tantalizing uh, entry point to sort of the second plant of how you, second plank of how you, uh, how industrial policy, in this case it was very primitive industrial policy relative to the kinds of industrial policies we've talked about, uh, which is really simply go in there with just these, you know, flood the industry with subsidies. And this, by the way, now the, the solar subsidies have now been totally, either completely phased out or almost phased out in China. Uh, but for, for you know, a long time, uh, they played this incredible role of, of installing capacity and the capacity because of learning by doing and other sort of mechanisms of, of, of technological innovation um, result in a significant uh, decline in the price. And, and, and these subsidies were critical in China, both in solar and wind, and the world uh, as a whole has, has, has benefited from that from a, from a climatic standpoint. Uh, let me just actually stop here. What about the third theme? Well, the third theme, I thought that you could, um, the third theme, very briefly, because I'm conscious here of the time, um, the third theme uh, was, was really uh, which, you know, this picture and the, the story that I just gave you about the role of industrial policies and subsidies is really about um, sort of thinking how uh, the role that um, incentivizing new technologies and new modes of production, in this case clean technologies and renewables, um, uh, has a parallel or reinforces um, our, our the discussions that we've had here in terms of creating um, a, a more of a productive, more inclusive, uh, good jobs economy in a kind of an experimentalist fashion. You'll see some of the parallels in the readings in this week by uh, Victor and Sable that focuses on, um, on, on, on uh, the energy, on the climate transition but many of the mechanisms that, that they discuss in terms of how to get that uh, done has parallels, what they call experimentalist governance, um, has parallels uh, with um, uh, the way that, 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 that we've broached the topic. So this is, I'm not going to go through this at length, uh, but um, this is a way of thinking about these new ways of thinking about industrial and innovation policy uh, that is, uh, that, you know, that is, that takes issues of capacity and uncertainty and, and, and you know, uh, the diversity of alternative governance and collaboration arrangements seriously. So I, I contrast sort of the, the, the second and third columns, which are the industrial policies for good jobs and the third column industrial policies for the climate transition. I contrast that with sort of the, the traditional conception of um, industrial policy that sort of has the, the kind of image one has of the East Asian model, uh, which in fact wasn't very descriptive in reality of East Asia, uh, but um, is the image that many of us carry when we talk about industrial policy and how that differs from the sort of this alternative model, okay? Um, but uh, uh, but so the, the key distinctions here is that uh, in, all, in all cases, of course, we're targeting specific, what an economist would call externalities that are, you know, that are particular learning, climate, or good jobs externalities. Um, and that defines kind of a, a number of, of, of sectors that we would target. Um, there are very clear differences in the assumptions that we make about the role of the government in the traditional East, East Asian model that we think that government is hard, strong, can keep the firms at arm's length and knows a lot about what needs to be done. Therefore, one result is that you have sort of these ex ante programs of, of subsidies that are targeted directly to sectors and firms that are directly targeted. You know enough about what policy has to be ex ante that industrial policy then consists of a set of activities or sectors that you target and a set of incentives that you provide and that's your industrial policy. Whereas under these sort of new forms of industrial policy, whether you're dealing with 
you know, um, increasing the supply of good jobs or, or, fat or, or speeding up the climate transition, the role of the government is very different. You start with a significant amount of uncertainty about where the problems are, how they can be solved, what the requisite policy instruments are going to be. Um, and you start with a view of the government that doesn't necessarily presume that the government has all this capacity. You start with the, with the notion that the capacity can be built um, and trust with the private sector can be built as you start building these relationships with um, private firms and other actors. Uh, so in that sense, it's, it's much, um, it assumes much less about the type of the government. Um, so the incentives and the application of the incentives, therefore, is much less, is much more evolving uh, rather than sort of given ex ante, um, there is um, you know the, the kind of the r the, the con conditionality that's involved. It's much less rigid. Um, so in the case of the experimentalist governance, for example, Victor and Sable talk about these default penalties, but these default pen penalties aren't really to enforce particular outcomes. It's to ensure that you're actually taking part in this collaboration and you're you're doing good faith efforts to go alongside with it rather than necessarily producing particular outcomes, uh, which what, what a hard ex ante conditionality would, would require. <coughs> okay? And finally, in terms of how you deal with the private sector and private uh, parties, it's not arm's, arm's length, uh, it's, much, it's directly collaborative and it's iterative. Um, so you're, you're in that sense, there's this notion of embeddedness or ongoing uh, collaboration. Okay. Now, this is the point where I was going to turn over to uh, Roberto, <laughs> who's conveniently disappeared, but might as well take a couple of comments. Uh, in this case, it's embedded in the outlook. But I'm trying to connect around uh, previous talks about what we're talking about. So, what advice would you give? So, I understand that there's people on the beach, for example, that you know them and you don't have the kind of situation to take in some of the areas. The CRC here is instrumental for that brings people to change. But there's also what's also happening here is that in the outside of human rights abuse going on for the first time, two weeks ago, and even not from this time, I mean, these can mine in rare assets or most of all these resources are in the of countries, and the mining has significant environmental impact. Right? So the quality of life of people around this uh, community is actually severely diminished as a result. And so the question around Everyone else is essentially enjoying the fruits of like, renewable energy, but these communities are actually in a problem of being Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I think the, the, the answer, of course, has got to be from the perspective of this course is first and foremost the actual producers, their communities, and their economies as a whole. Um, and if this is not happening because the human rights of the workers, are being, um, and, 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 and their labor rights are uh, systematically repressed, that there is you know, uh, use of child labor um, and other violations of internationally recognized uh, labor rights, um, that the practice of mining is creating huge problems for the local communities. Um, you know, then, then, you know, I then something is going very badly wrong. Um, and the question is, you know, sort of what would an appropriate solution look like and then who stands in the way or what kind of institutional arrangements. Now, my very sort of superficial reading of this would be um, that as the part of the solution would obviously require, um, you know, sort of abiding by international recognized labor rights, uh, investing in technologies of mining the product um, uh, or compensating the communities in ways uh, to ensure that the communities as well as the workers uh, and the firms are benefiting, and having a price of cobalt uh, that reflects all the additional costs of making those investments. Um, now, none, none of this seems to me to be impossible to achieive, um, and, uh, if, and, 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 the question, uh, and the question as to why this has not proved uh, feasible, I would say, as in so many development problems, I would put the primary blame uh, uh, on the local governments, on the national governments, um, that you know that they are benefiting enough from the existing arrangements um, and the rents, and they don't want to rock the boat, and they're not particularly interested in the well-being of the local 
uh, miners and the local communities. So it's a local political failure uh, that is presenting, that is preventing what otherwise seems like an, you know, a, a clear cut and appropriate solution. Now, are the foreign users implicit, complicit in this? Are the firms complicit in this? And what should they do? Uh, that's a kind of a both a kind of a moral and a financial question. And I think, you know, morally, I would say that one would not be complicit uh, in, uh, you know, flagrant abuses of labor and human rights. And, and to the extent that those things are well documented, whether they're in Xinjiang or whether they're in DRC. Uh, that there ought to be, um, you know, restrictions on that kind of commerce. Um, so, you know, but so we should not partake in trade or commercial activities um, that um, uh, that entail very significant human rights abuses. Not necessarily because we think that will have a significant impact. It may not, uh, but because we don't want to be morally complicit in, in something. It's a different kind of an argument. Um, but ultimately, I think it, it just, it's just just a matter for for local governments. I think they they are the ones in the driving seat um, as far as, as this. Particularly, you know, in, in 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 industries like cobalt and lithium, where you have, you know, relatively few suppliers um, of this. That, that you know, it, it, so it's, it's it, it seems would be relatively easy to address if the local governments were willing to do that. Good. So I want to return to an Amazonian example. I want to give an example from the Amazon. Again, as I've done before in earlier moments in the course, and against the background of this Amazonian narrative, then speak to the third of the three themes that Danny has just addressed, to the method and its relation to politics not just with respect to climate change, but with respect to all the themes that we've been discussing in the course. So I begin by uh, making a few descriptive and interpretive points about the situation in the Amazon. The Amazon is the biggest reservoir of biodiversity and of fresh water in the world. It is by a large order of magnitude, uh, the greatest tropical rainforest in the world. And 60% of this tropical rainforest is in Brazil. It includes two parts, a forested part, which is the majority, and then a deforested part, either because it is the result of deforestation or because from the beginning it uh, represented a tropical or subtropical savanna. Uh, and about 25 million people live and work in the Amazon, in the forested part of the Amazon, uh, which is the majority. Uh, a few words about the historical background. In the 1970s, when Brazil was under a military regime, the government induced people to come from the south of the country, smallholders, adventurers, and occupy the Amazon. And in occupying it, to begin to deforest it. This was part of official governmental policy. And they did this for geopolitical reasons, because they believed that the Amazon could not be defended unless it was occupied. Then in the 1980s and 90s, there was a radical shift to a different orientation. And Brazil began to develop one of the most rigorous systems of environmental legislation in the world. Uh, so today, for example, according to the law in the Amazon, for any plot of land, regardless of its size, 80% has to be reserved or preserved, and only 20% can be put to productive use. This, this results in a somewhat irrational pattern, a, a, a quilt of preserved and productive areas uh, without much economic justification. Of course, this uh, rigorous legislation is uh, not always, or not most of the time, actively implemented. So this is law in the books, not law in practice. 
but it nevertheless imposes a high legal standard that the people interested in the preservation of the Amazon can appeal to. The aggregate result is that still today, despite everything that has happened, the, the large, unostentatious amount of deforestation, something close to 85% of the original Amazonian rainforest is preserved. That's an astonishing example when it's compared to what has happened generally in the world, and including, of course, in the European countries, which have been prodigal in destroying their own forests. Uh, and uh, uh, it then brings us to the present situation. Now, uh, what are the main economic activities in the Amazon today to give you a clear picture of its economic reality? In the eastern Amazon, in the state of Pará, the main economic activity is mining. It is a relatively primitive mining. Iron ore is taken out of the ground, barely transformed, put in ships, and sent to China, the workshop of the world. So there we have the essential base of this trade between the untransformed commodities exported from Brazil and the products of human ingenuity that are sent to us in return. And the second major uh, economic activity uh, in the Amazon is the free trade zone of Manaus. Uh, was a fiscally tax protected uh, free zone for the development of the Amazon. And there, the surprising or not surprising thing is that for the most part, what the free zone produces has nothing to do with the Amazon. Their characteristic activities are to assemble, to assemble, not to produce the components of, for example, cell phones and motorcycles. So they might just as well be in southeastern China rather than in the Amazon. They have nothing to do with the peculiarities of the Amazon region. It does have a certain consequence for protection, for the protection of the Amazon, because it attracts the population to the city, gives it jobs, and keeps it out of the forest. Uh, then once we go beyond those two major activities, then there are a set of other things that happen. So in the forest itself, there is a primitive extractivist activity. Uh, rubber tappers who live and, for example, take latex out of the trees. No scale, very little technology, and you could summarize no future in that activity. But that is the natural extractivism that survives as a kind of subsistence form of production. And on the periphery of the Amazon, then, we have uh, slash and burn, episodic deforestation by land grabbers, uh, and uh, then largely illegal logging. And the predominant economic activity is then low intensity cattle grazing which in turn degrades the land, transforms it into degraded pasture land. And a little bit of the soy farming that comes from the center west of the country. Now, to get a fuller picture, you have to understand another aspect of the historical genealogy that uh, I skipped in my brief historical narrative. Uh, and that is that when these adventurers or petty bourgeois entrepreneurs were attracted from the south to occupy the Amazon, they were, they were, quote, given land, but their title to the land was never regularized. So they remain as squatters, not with clear legal title. Uh, the various left parties and left movements seem to have maintained an interest in 
maintaining these populations in this situation of legal irregularity. So they can then be dependent on the various political apparatuses that exist there uh, in a semi-collective form. Uh, and then the land grabbers come and try, try to acquire this land and establish clear legal title to it. So there's a massive land confusion, land tenure confusion in the Amazon. Until recently, less than 4% of the land in private hands had clear legal title. The result is that no one knows who has what. And of course, if no one knows who has what, pillage, devastation, will always be more attractive than either production or preservation. Uh, and one more word then about the Indian tribes. So we have these sparse Indian tribes in the Amazon uh, it, with various degrees of assimilation or isolation from Brazilian society. Uh, they were given vast tracts of land. Something like 21% of the Amazon is given over to the Indian tribes. But simultaneously, under official policy, they were forbidden from most forms of productive exploitation of this land. The result of the strange combination of prodigality in the concession of land with severity in the opening up of economic and educational opportunities is that the Indian populations are sinking into a, a, a quagmire of alcoholism, drug addiction, depression, and so forth. Uh, so there you have the Amazon, which now becomes an object of the attention of the world. And a large part of the world, like, for example, Germany and Norway, which want to finance preservationist activities in the Amazon, uh, would, in truth, despite the lip service that they give to sustainable development, want to maintain the Amazon as a park for the benefit of humanity, untouched. Uh, and the Amazon is not going to be a park because Brazil doesn't want it and because 25 million people live and work there. So uh, what then are the points of departure for facing this reality that I have just described summarily? So first, you have to understand the Amazon is not just a collection of trees. It's a multitude of people. And of the, if these people have no productive opportunities for sustainable production, they will be driven to deforest and to destroy the Amazon. There's no alternative. Uh, now, second, the premise of everything, the beginning of any solution for the Amazon, is the clarification of land tenure. No good can come from this situation in which no one knows who has what. We have to resolve the problem of land title. And a clear resolution of this problem through secure property for the present possessors is not necessarily the point of arrival, but it is the point of departure. Uh, now, third, we have to create a situation in which the forest standing is worth more than the forest cut down. And to do that, we have to create the framework for a real logging business, and in the future, for the mobilization of this reservoir of biodiversity uh, for the development, for example, of an advanced biochemical or pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore, move in the direction of an inclusive and sustainable productivism. Uh, the essential point in such a project is to connect 
the urban industrial complex with the green complex. And that then defines the beginning of a project. So what are the connections? None of them are now made. Not even the elementary basis for them exists. First, there has to be a technological and scientific connection. Starting with the obvious, for example, uh, technology to manage a heterogeneous tropical forest basically doesn't exist in the world. Almost all the te forest technology that evolved in the world evolved to manage homogeneous temperate forests. So it has to be created and essentially created from zero. Uh, and then in the future, of course, the much more complicated challenge of consolidating the scientific and technological base for the use of these biochemical resources of the Amazon. As I said, the advanced pharmaceutical industry and so forth. Second, there has to be a link of services, environmental services, provided over this vast land area, much larger than the European Union, uh, in order to uh, implement the legal framework. Third, there have to be economic linkages between the use of the products in the forest and, this, and the urban industrial complex, many intermediate forms of production. And fourth, there has to be the creation of a diversity of legal regimes under which the forest could be used. So, Traditional small-scale property resulting from the clarification of legal title would be, as I said, simply the point of departure, not the point of arrival. We would need to create alternatives to what now seems to be the only option, which is the concession of large areas of the Amazon to big companies. Different forms of community property and community management for example. Uh, now then, against the background of this brief scheme, I want to enunciate three propositions, uh, which are in increasing order of their controversial character. So the first is, should, should be relatively uncontroversial. The project that is required is a productivist project. It is not, in essence, a preservationist project. It is not a project for the constitution of a vast park for the benefit and delight of humanity. But it is a productivist project that should be animated, that should give practical content to the idea of sustainable development, a form of production that preserves the natural resource rather than eroding it. Because without that, the people, the people will have no opportunities and the result will be destruction. The second proposition is not as self-evident as the first. Uh, the second proposition is that the kind of project that is required uh, is necessarily an instance of the knowledge economy. A high technology, experimental, innovation-oriented project. Anything dealing with a reality with, like the Amazon is now either a form of primitive and disorganized extractivism, illegal logging, taking latex out of the trees, or it is 
a version of the advanced knowledge economy. There's nothing in between. It's either one or the other. There's no intermediate step. So uh, it is the knowledge economy applied to a reality to which we're not accustomed to apply it. It's not Silicon Valley, but it, it does require a similar logic of radical innovation and disruption and the use of all of the resources of contemporary science and technology. Now comes the third proposition, and the third proposition may be the most contentious, and it regards the method, the reality, that, and the political reality which such a project would require. Now, remember the way in which Sable and Victor in their book, in the introductory chapter, characterize this happy situation that they describe. They say, there is a combination of top-down and bottom-up policy. There's a combination of expertise, or technocracy, and democracy. And there's a combination of the market and the government. Now, I ask you, where would this combination in today's world be most likely to be manifest? Uh, and my answer is, in a benign form in the European Union. The European Union of Jacques Delors. The European Union as it is today under the dead hand of technocratic centrism. That's where this combination of attributes would be most likely to be manifest. Uh, democracy, but not too much democracy. Democracy combined with technocracy top down and bottom up, a little bit of market, a little bit of state, and so forth. And in a less benign form in China, it's a project for the Chinese. It's the typical thing that you might think the, the technical apparatus of the state council would be involved in and discussing with the, with the regional governments of China. And in Sable and Victor's characterization of this non-political politics. There is the telltale allusion to the philosopher John Dewey, uh, uh, the philosopher of expertise, of a technical form of democracy. When, for reasons which I'll now state, I think that the, the reality of such a project would come closer to Carl Schmitt than it would to John Dewey. Uh, now, uh, and you have to imagine. You might want to say who Carl Schmitt is. Yes, Carl, well, <laughs> Carl Schmitt was a, was a, was a theorist, a, a right-wing theorist of politics. Uh, ultimately, he, wa he was viewed as the constitutional theory of the, of the Nazi regime, though he was, in fact, not long connected to, to, to the Hitler regime. Uh, but his view of politics was politics is about friends and enemies. It's radical conflict. And it's not dialogue and hand-holding about technical cooperation. Uh, that was Carl Schmitt. And Carl Schmitt is an object of interest now by both the left and the right around the world. Uh, and in China, for example, there's a significant faction of academics that carefully study the work of Carl Schmitt. Uh, so what are the constituencies that would be in conflict over the fate of the Amazon and the progression of a project like the project that I've just outlined? So, uh, First, there, there is the regressive right-wing constituency represented by the loggers, uh, the squatters, the people who are slashing and burning. And 
it is representative of this petty bourgeois entrepreneurial element in Brazilian society, which is then attracted to this, to this position. And they're impatient with this somewhat hypocritical uh, preservationism and this uh, attribution to the Indians of vast amounts of the Indian tribes of vast amounts of land without any compensating economic or educational advantages. And they're up in arms against the implementation of this environmental legislation, literally up in arms. So the environmental legislation would have to be imposed by force of arms by the federal police and by the army. Now there's a second constituency, which are the enlightened bourgeois classes in the southeast of the Amazon, uh, in the southeast of Brazil. They've never set foot in the Amazon, nor will they ever set foot in the Amazon. The Amazon for them is a kind of Disneyland, but it's a Disneyland to which one doesn't take one's children. <laughs> because if, they, if you were to take them there, the children would come back, their faces bloated by the mosquito bites, uh, they would be sweltering and fainting and so forth. So it's a kind of fantasy. They go to the real Disneyland, not to this Disneyland, which one of our writers called our tropical Siberia. Uh, and, uh, uh, and for them, of course, the more preservation, pure preservation, the park, the idea of the park, which the Germans and the Norwegians also want to establish in Brazil, uh, is, is, is what attracts them. So these are the two tangible and organized currents of opinion in the country about the Amazon. And what is then the current of opinion that is going to support the alternative project? The project that I just outlined of the linking between the green complex and the urban industrial complex. Uh, the form of sustainable development that is an instance of the knowledge economy. It has to be created. It doesn't have any antecedent reality. And that would be true generally of any transformative project. So there has to be the idea cultivated in the country that in each of its large regions, including the Amazon, the country has a second chance. It can reinvent itself in the Amazon. The Amazon is a vanguard of our national development. And uh, then we, we, we have this project. We say uh, we don't have a future simply as an exporter of untransformed commodities to China. Uh, we, have to, we have to bet on intelligence and not just on the easy wealth of nature. Or we have to bet on the marriage of nature to intelligence. Uh, but not on this easy way out that we have used to finance the consumption of the urban masses, which are, are agricultural and ranching and mining wealth. And the Amazon is a prime place in which we can exemplify the solution to the national enigma. So there has to be that project. It has to be presented to the country. It has to be the subject of a conflict. Uh, uh, virulent and sometimes violent uh, and, in and always conflictual. And it's in that context that such a project could advance in no other. So it's not going to look like John Dewey and Jacques Delors and so forth. It's going to be real politics. It's going to be a struggle over alternative visions of the national future. Uh, and that is then the principle that I would apply, not just to this discussion today, but to every part of our discussion in the course.
Of course, of course. And they, and they I hope, would support this project that I described. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, not a mass pro it's not a mass constituency yet. It's not organized. Uh, and it doesn't even have the ideas, all of the ideas that would be, that would be needed. Huh? And I would say that often it is in its articulation of its position, it's tempted to emphasize the preservationist rather than the productivist elements. Because after all, the whole enigma is in the nature of this production. What is one, one going to do? So, for example, if you were to contemplate using uh, the biochemical diversity of the Amazon, in, for the development of, of drugs or pharmaceuticals. The problem is not simply uh, a, a problem of the organization of production. The, the truth is that the basic science for most of that doesn't even exist. And there's no way that Brazil is going to be able to develop it all by itself. So we would have to change our orientation to the world. We would have to be open to world science. We would have to attract teams and laboratories of scientists from around the world. Uh, taking advantage of the enormous fascination which the Amazon exercises. Uh, and separating the patronage of the states from the interests of these separate scientific teams. That's a little example of how difficult it would be in detail to produce this transformation. Yes. No, I think it's part of this process of land titling. Uh, you know, in, in a real country, in a real society, there's a huge amount of ideological confusion. Uh, and, so, and, and so, for example, the, the, the part of the Brazilian church, the, the Catholic church, which takes the greatest interest in the Amazon is the, the far south, he, the, the southernmost states of Brazil. So the, the pastoral committee of land and Indians and so forth, these are bishops and priests from the south of the country. Now, who are they? And this, I'm giving you this as an example of ideological confusion. So they are the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of Bavarian and Italian peasants. And so cultivating still the dream of the peasant family happy in the countryside, which they attempted to implement in their states and failed. Now they're going to try and implement it in the Amazon. So the Amazon has to pay the price for the frustrations of Piedmont and Bavaria. So this is what happens in a real country. So it's, it's, to, it, it's totally inapplicable to the reality. But it is, it's an example because we have a country in which the regions are so, dis, are so different from one another and physically so distant from one another that they might as well be on different planets. And so it's possible then to fantasize about them rather than to see them in their, in their, in their reality. Huh? And we, we have to establish a different situation. Huh? That's why I thought that one of the most uh, progressive things we could do in the country 
would be to subject all those who are exempted from mandatory military service, all the young people who were exempted from mandatory military service, to mandatory social service, and then to send them to different regions of the country so that they could discover the country. But then, of course, I, re I reflected that a government that could send the bourgeois youth of Sao Paulo to the Amazon could do anything. So if we could do that, we could do anything else. <laughs> Yes. So when you were mentioning the method and uh, physical reality, you, you mentioned the places to be for a combination of top down and bottom up for this project. Yes. And I was wondering is that correlation with the field for a bottom up movement? And who should be like the shareholders, like the tribe, the government, the local government, or a candidate? I'm not against combining top-down and, 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 and bottom-up and all those other things that they want to combine there. I think the problem is that the note of unreality is sounded when you, you, you fail to appreciate that this project is being conducted under extreme tension because there are these other groups that are against it. Uh, and then, and then, and then are trying to defeat it, and so that's what I—that's the note of reality, which has to be appreciated in this situation. And every transformative project has to create its own constituency over time. So the problem with this project that I've described is that its constituency doesn't yet exist in an established form. It exists as these sparse academics. But the people who would work in this, uh, in this version of the knowledge economy don't exist yet. And so we, we have to bring them into existence, and, but in the context of this national debate in which this is seen as an opportunity for the country. That's a very tall order. Uh, and it, it's nothing like the tone of this cordial experimentalism, which is evoked in the, in the Victor and Sable book. It's fighting. Uh, and, it's, and it's fighting about visions and fighting about interests. It has a very different tone. Yes? largest internal explosion teams that have been uh, that, that's taken place for decades over very these very issues that you're describing. From a, from a legal standpoint, there, there's some frameworks that have come into place. For example, the Forest Rights Act legislation of 2006, which recognizes both individual as well as community forest rights. Not fully uh, materialized, but at least it's the provisions are there. The, the question that I have for you is increasingly we're seeing biodiversity collapse being elevated to almost the same level as the climate crisis. Too much attention is placed on the 50 gigatons of annual emissions from anthropogenic activities, not enough on the 550 gigatons stored in forest and other vegetation, 1700 gigatons stored in the permafrost. So when, what you describe as primitive and extractivist, I can think of several ecologists and climate scientists who can actually say that forest dwelling communities, indigenous communities have actually been prescient and ecologically sensitive. The reason we've continued to have intact habitats and vegetation is because of their low resource, um, you know, not so much noble savage, but long-term indigenous sort of understandings of the cycles of nature. Of course. How, of how would you respond to that? And, and also, vis-a-vis -vis your point about um, linking what you call the green complex and the industrial or the urban complex, they may say that we can use the knowledge economy for things like, for example, mixed-use land plan, uh, where you maintain pure conservation zones which are required, as well as some promotional zones. They may say we need to think about market issues. So I'm curious to hear how you how you respond to that. I do not deny that these uh, native populations uh, 
many of them are white coming from other parts of the country, but they've been there for a long time. I do not deny that they have a great deal of implicit, highly useful knowledge. Uh, I simply made the point that this kind of subsistence extractivism that has neither technology nor scale has no future. It has no economic future. It's fine, you can pay them to take care of the trees and, uh, and, send art and, and produce artisanal products, but it's not serious. Uh, and it's, it, it, it's not a serious solution to the problems of this vast region and this vast country. Uh, so it's a cop-out, it's, it's, it's an evasion. Uh, and we ought to bite the bullet, we ought to face the reality. What is a serious project with scale, with technology, with a chance of prospering in the world? Yes? If I may, I, I love your opinion on this in terms of this landscape, right? Those, most of the margins of our current development paradigms offer potentially no solutions. Well, well, but wait, let me interrupt you there. No real country is a blank slate. That's the problem. So it's the, the problem is that these hostile constituencies, the two hostile constituencies that I described are in place. They're there. And so it's not a blank slate. It's not a vacuum. There's never a vacuum. So we're, we're intervening in an area which is already filled with these hostile forces. We better have a powerful project. I, I completely, completely agree with you on that. So if we're to sort of, if we're to characterize, if we're to subjugate and leverage asset class, the tourism asset class, you know, alternative building material asset classes, nutraceuticals, pharmaceuticals, and so on. How do we ensure that the same logic of the market which leads to extractivist modes of production isn't replicatable in the very same way? From a sequencing standpoint, once we have land rights in place, and that's a huge hypothetical, where do you go from there? What else would you add into the sequence to make sure that the same mistakes are made? Which mistakes? Well, because we, we start on a completely different basis. We, we start with the intention to, 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 to produce for the future, to have a productivist agenda, to produce at scale, uh, to be plugged into world markets, uh, and, and that's a completely different project. Uh, and it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a project that, that involves the use of the Amazon. Uh, it, this is what it means for there to be sustainable development, that we're going to exploit it in a form that simultaneously preserves it. And uh, uh, it's very common for the, for the discourse of sustainable development to be used by those who in fact don't want it. What they really want is the park. Uh, and this becomes very clear in our discussion with the Europeans. The less we go into the Amazon from their standpoint, the better. That's their idea. I, I want to I just briefly, we're running out of yeah. time, but very briefly, try to defend Victor and Sable by, pos by positioning them somewhat differently. Okay. As, as, as in, service, in the service of your narrative. Yes. So, uh, I, I, I mean, I, 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 I like a lot the way that you put that any kind of global um, any kind of global sustainable sustainable development or, or, or climate change agenda has to be married to a productivist project. That there is, you have to give people a reason as to how they will improve their lives in a productive manner uh, as, as part of this, of this project. Then you laid out a kind of a almost impossible political dilemma, a political conundrum, which is that in the kind of project pr productivist scenario that you have in mind, the beneficiaries of that project are not yet present. That yes. They will have to be created. Now that's a kind of a political <laughs> a, a no, a no go. So I would like to position, I would like to suggest that um, the, uh, the Victor and Sable approach, uh, which is this experimentalist starting from what they're bringing in stakeholders and groups alongside on a kind of a uh, not overtly political, but a overtly political and of beneficial relationship 
is a part of the process of building that Without that, a doubt. That, so, that path. so I exaggerated to make my point because I am by nature a dialectical and I like to sharpen divides. But, but so for example, I mentioned the free zone of Manaus, which now is just assembling things and could be in Hong Kong. Uh, so of course, we engage them to, so they can be engaged in higher value added activities and the nature of the enterprises that exist there can be transformed. The mining now in the state of Pará, instead of just leaving holes in the ground, can take things out and start to transform them, and so forth. Yeah, but the, the point is, is that it's not trivial. It's a, it's a, it's a key mechanism. It's a key of course way it is. of, of, of course in, it embarking is. on this agenda. Of course so, it is. OK, good. We agreed again. Um, <laughs> uh, OK, um, <laughs> see you next week on uh, globalization. I'm not as unreasonable as I seem to be. <laughs> <laughs>